Okay, now we're going to take a look at how we would represent data for prediction to a neural network or to a support vector machine. We've seen other ways that you can represent data, but representing temporal data or data through time, there's various ways to do that, and we're going to look at two of the most common ways to actually do that. Okay, the data will have to be normalized for the neural network. There, the easiest way to do that is to look at the percent change. Let's see how we might do that and why we would want to do that. If we're looking at financial data, that is data for perhaps the stock market or securities market or something, we're going to look at the data sort of in the form where we'll have the price of the security on the y-axis and we'll have time on the x-axis. Now the security that we're trying to predict will move on this chart. This is a security that's just going up. Wouldn't this be nice if everything behaved this way? But this is just mainly for example purposes. And we're going to look at how we would want to normalize this. We're going to take individual samples of data at various points. If we're dealing with real-time data, you're going to have to pick the, the bar or the sampling interval here. This could be every minute, every hour, every four times a day. There's a variety of ways to do that. If we're processing end-of-day data, which is what I'm going to use for this example, then the interval might be every day, every market trading day in particular. And you can see that basically we're going to look at the price of the security at each of these points. Now we're going to want to look at the percentage change. We want to feed the percentage change into the neural network because it's relatively easy to normalize. It's almost pre-normalized because a percent is going to be in the range of 0 to 100 or taken just as the ratio form it's going to be 0 up to 1 which is exactly the the way in which a neural network wants its data. Now if we just feed the ratio in that will work just fine so long as the stocks do not move more than 100 percent over the course of a day. Usually this is the case. That might be different with certain extreme penny stock situations where the price could potentially double or triple in a day in rare cases, but even in that case we could just cap it at 100 percent for purposes of the neural network because if you've got a prediction that a stock has gone up by 100 percent or 200 percent you're doing pretty good. I don't think it really it really matters that the difference between those two, at least in this simple case. The reason we care about the percent too is we want to isolate, the neural network that is, wants to isolate patterns in this. So that's really what you're trying to do. Now this particular security, now this is all completely made up, but you can visually see some of the patterns, like there, there, this particular security seems to like to plateau and then shoot upward. Well, if we were not looking at percentage change, we the neural network would have to learn, oh, when it was at this level, it might go up. When it was at this level, it might go up. When it was at this level, it might go up. We don't want to have to teach the neural network that is, if this was, say, $50 a share, this was $60 a share, it doesn't really matter. The pattern is likely that it has plateaued and then it goes up. It could plateau somewhere in the middle here and then possibly go up. So by doing it as a percent, we're looking at each of these areas as just a local isolated area. Wherever price, if the percentage chain starts to flatten out for a little bit, then it's likely to see an increase. And that's just one pattern. A real security could have all kinds of patterns, and is probably a lot more complicated than this, but this demonstrates it. 
So the next thing you want to do is define what the input neurons and the output neurons are going to be like. Say for example, we wanted, you're going to have to create an input window and a prediction window. So here we're going to look at maybe using just four of these sample points to predict it. So we would divide the neural network into four of these segments, and then we might use just a single value as the predicted output. So given these four levels, or these four changes in percent, what is going to happen the very next day? So we need a trailing four days of prediction to predict the next day. Now you need to experiment with this. This is one of the areas that will determine your success is the size of the prediction window. And the size of the prediction window might change or might be more optimal depending on the security. And then the anticipated output is that one next day. Now you could have more than one. You might want it to predict, say, the next three days. And in that case, you just, um, you just adjust it as needed to maybe you would make this three. Maybe you're going to take four as an input and you want to predict the next four. So this neural network or support vector machine would have four inputs. four inputs, or input neurons, and one output. Okay, that is, that is basically how the chart looks. Now, sometimes you might have a prediction window of just one, and also an output of, or an actual output of, or anticipated output of just one. That's done with Elman and Jordan, or a simple recurrent neural networks. A typical feed-forward neural network would not get enough data because you need to give it a window. So we'll learn more about Elman and Jordan, or simple recurrent neural networks, in future sessions. Now let's look at how we would actually calculate some of the data. Let's go ahead and, and look at some sample price or some sample pricing data for a hypothetical security. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and enter some of the data that we're going to actually look at for this security. It'll start out at 45. Then say the next day, for example, it goes up to 46. After that, it goes up to 47. And I'm going to go ahead and time lapse this as I enter the rest of these. And through the magic of time lapse, you see all of the values now entered. So we want to look at the actual change on each one of these. For the first one, we don't really know what the change is because we don't have the value for the previous day. But here it went up by 1. Here it went up by 1 as well. And I'll go ahead and fill in the rest of those. So here we see all of the changes in there. These are just the point changes. They're not percentage changes yet. And we're going to look now at the percentage changes. So that is just point change. The percentage changes we'll have to calculate for each one. Again, for the first value, we really don't have a number because we don't have the previous one. The first one is going to be, and this is just doing a simple percent calculation, it's going to be a 2% change. And I'll go ahead and time lapse the rest of them. And there we have all of the percentage changes. Now these are the percent changes. Those values are all between negative 1 and 1. I believe I said between 0 and 1 before. I forgot to look at the case where the stock goes down. but 
negative 1 and 1 is perfectly acceptable inputs for a neural network. And we're going to look now at how we want to represent the, the um, input and output to the neural network. Well, we've got to create the prediction window. So let's look at a prediction window of three values. So we're going to look at those three. That's the first one anyway. And then the anticipated output will be that. So that's the prediction. That's what's used to predict. And this is the actual, um, the anticipated output. Now we're going to create these to train it. So to create the first training row for the neural network, we have to look at what the input is going to be. The input is going to be those first three. So it's going to be 0, 0 0.02, and then 0, 0.02 again. And then it's going to be the negative 0, 0.15. And then the ideal that we're training it with is going to be that 0 0.05. So that is the first set of training data. The next one, we're just going to slide the window forward. It's almost like we take this whole little thing and then move it down. So we're going to start with 0 0.02, which is actually the same value we started with before, but it's the second one that we're starting with. So we're going to write in a 0 0.02. Next one's now going to be this negative 0 0.15. And then the ideal now is shifted, because it's now just part of the training data now part of the input data. And we're going to hope that these three would predict the 0 0.07. And you basically just keep on generating additional training data for, from the data that you have up here. Ideally, you would have quite a bit of data to actually train the neural network with. This is, what you would use, this is what you would submit to the neural network for training. Then hopefully, say the neural network was trained on this one, this one, and this one on the chart, the first three plateaus, hopefully it would see the fourth plateau and actually be able to predict it. This is how you structure data for prediction with a feed-forward network. Now, if you were going to do a Elman-type neural network, then your data, or for uh, Elman and Jordan, are both types of uh, simple recurrent network. And I hope to show those in future videos, SRN. There, you basically have one input. So it'd be like this 0 0.02. That would result in 0 0.02. Then you'd have another training data, which is also 0 0.02. And that would result in negative 0 0.15. So that is showing you these first two for a simple recurrent network. Now notice the problem. You're telling the neural network, OK, for 0 0.02, give me 0 0.02 except for when it's 0 0.02. Give me negative 0 0.15. That would cause a problem for a feed-forward neural network. However, a simple recurrent network is represents the context. So it knows, OK, if I've seen two of these in a row, then I should give something different. We'll see more about those in the future.